Hello, my name is Tom Cronin. In 1991 and 1992, I conducted a comprehensive series of interviews on camera with a diverse, often eclectic, cross-section of Orleans residents. Some I knew personally, others I had never met. All had a solid connection to Orleans. The intent of these interviews was to record through the eyes of the people and their experience their history of the town. Funding for the series was provided by a generous grant from the Community Preservation Council of $18,000 and a further contribution of $12,000 from American Heritage Realty, now Cape Cod Ocean View Real Estate. I sincerely hope you enjoy our series, In Those Days, Historic Voices of Orleans. Swing and a miss by Cooper on a high fastball. One and two. Then Tony would come in and catch. Would hit for Flaherty. Or maybe Mike Greenwell. I don't know. He can't. Can't swing the bat. Here's the pitch. Cooper hits it high in the air to center field, but not well enough. There's Brian McRae. Glasses down. Under it. Makes the catch. And the side is retired. But the Red Sox got a run. On one hit, a team triple. They leave him in. They've stranded nine runners. As we go to the top of the ninth in the third game of this three-game series, it's still Kansas City 5 and Boston 2. What? I said that's funny to have that Red Sox game going. Why? Because you? you're just as steady as the Red Sox, you know, every <laughs> spring. <laughs> so getting the ball ready for one more campaign. How, how many years have you had it? Fifteen years. Fifteen years? Fifteen years. Uh, where were you fellows born? Right in New Orleans. Both We've lived here all our lives. Yeah. Yeah. Where did you live? Um, Over on uh, Pine Ridge. Well, we, well, all around, everywhere. We were in East Orleans, <laughs> Orleans Center, South Orleans. God, we lived everywhere. We never got bored where we lived. We weren't, didn't live in any place. Where we didn't have a home. We rented, place. you know, rented places. And yeah. I, we, this was before refrigerators and electric lights, you know. <laughs> I, I would, Christ, we didn't have a, uh, didn't have indoor plumbing in our house uh, until I was 16 years old. So things were quite different then Basically, than they are now. Our mother was a secretary to the selectmen in the town for, for uh, many years. Yeah. And, uh, uh, Elma Dowling was a shellfish warden. Yeah, I worked yeah. for Elma when I was 12. I graduated in 40, 48. And I graduated from in 54 Marlins. from Marlins. He went. went to Pittsburgh State Teachers, and I went to uh, Mass Maritime. I graduated from there in 57. Went to the Navy for a couple of years, got out, and kicked around here because shipping was terrible, couldn't ship out in Richmond, so I went fishing. That's been it since 1963. We live right next to the Wilcoxes and the, and the Youngs, you know. We lived, well, I was, uh, Ted wasn't involved with the Rock Hop crowd, but I was. and. Uh, you know, Phil Schwinn and, and Harris and um, Roy Richardson. And well, they were still the whole, you know, Lester, <laughs> Lester Young, uh, Scrag Baker, Cal Baker. Um, you know, I was day to day with around with those people, and uh, there's a lot more. Um, with Jeannie Fulcher, I fished with him, I fished with Howard Walker. Uh, good people to go fishing with, a lot, of, lot of fun. Warren Goff, yeah. The uh, in the 
Yeah, and that was... Both uh, Crawl and Enskull up in with Warren. Earl Eldridge. Worked with him. A lot of them are dead now, but... Harry, I worked with Harry for four years. Harry Hunt. That's an education in itself. The Cutlass Baron, which is the... Where the... Not the other end, where the, where the uh, propeller attaches. I had to put an extension on that. When I get through here, I'm going down there. And this has been a lot of messing around. Trying to line everything up. The engine and the shaft and the propeller. And going outside, i got to put the propeller on now. I don't need a light for that. <laughs> I came by Monomoy Point one day and I came, <laughs> came too close, it was low tide, and I had it on autopilot, and I did and I saw this, this is dark patch in the water, low tide, and I didn't pay attention, I said, that, well, I thought, well, maybe it's some grass, it was too late anyway, I couldn't, I couldn't shut the autopilot off and fit time enough, so, let's see, anyway, it was kabang, and, <laughs> What I hit was a, a bulldozer run off the point of Monomoy and I hit it. Yes, it took took one of these, took this right off, right here. I played five years of basketball, varsity, and one year in baseball, but then girls came along and forget about that. <laughs> I, did, I was involved with hunting and fishing all the time. I couldn't, I, I would have had asthma, so I couldn't play any competitive sports, but. I was an avid hunter, always have been all my life, and a fisherman. We were talking about seals. We shoot, you know, like hunting and all, but that was part of our lifestyle at that time. Was you, you, there was a bounty on seals. We sh shoot seals, get five dollars for those. Boy, you go out, selectman, you go out and shoot all you can. They, they eat the fish, wait and fish every day, and uh, they don't eat that wait and fish, but. Uh, they take bites out of fish. They kill a lot, like flounders. We used to, you know, they just cleaned the place out down here. Used to be people. Would, it was a real tradition for us in the family. I God, they took me out in the fish box, I guess, and Ted too. Were, like we go down the mill pond, and you could fill a, you know, fill a five-gallon pail with flounders all you wanted any you know, any time in the winter. Now you can't get any at all. And uh, it's just, I was talking with a fellow up in Duxbury. He says the same thing up there. And, used to be able to catch, but they can't do it anymore. And I was granted as a fishing pressure is more intense, but these uh, seals and cormorants are, are killing, uh, they've killed the fish in, the, in, the, in all the ponds, in the, the place, in the, in the nest. The cormorants are, are voracious feeders, as the seal is. <laughs> I was started in rock, out of Rock Hab when I was 15 years old on a quahog dragger, and I worked my way through college on a sea scalloper, and I've been a, uh, had a fisher skipper and, uh, and I've also run boats for private, you know, in the summers and all. And did So I've always been involved in the fisheries and I've had my own boat since, oh, for the last 15 years and worked it on the side or in the summer when I wasn't teaching. Sometimes we leave like at 9, nine o'clock even, we 9.30 at night we've left at that time. Yeah, it depends on how far we have to go because uh, basically just be there for the slack. Let the gear turn on the tide, tide turn on the gear and then pick it up and start hauling it. Actually, about quarter of five. You know. That's as close as we fish. We fish about two hours and 15 minutes is the closest we fish. That's a little bit further than we could go. And we fish as far as four and a half hours offshore. But the tides are high course tides then. So we go for that far. You know. Not the high course tides, we fish kind of close to home because the tide runs so hard. And if it's a rough day, that makes it twice as hard. We have hang on days. One hand hang on and two hand hang on. <laughs> Sometimes it's crawling. I had a little funny sensation when I was about 22 years old. I had to go down the, in, the, in the village of a sea scholar but to get something. And I got a little woozy, but I was fine once I got out of there. I think it was more being confined than anything else. Most people don't have a frame of reference for what we do in terms of, most, we're not, you know, we're, I don't think we're unique, it's just the job is unique. Uh, anybody, I don't think it's any big deal about it. It's just, it's, 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 it's a state of mind as much as anything. Uh, 
when we were offshore lobstering. So we'd work quite a few times. We'd get all the way out there, which was 12 hours uh, to steam, and then uh, get a bad weather forecast. So we'd have to tend all our gear. And so many times we worked uh, 36 hours straight. The one time we worked, worked 42 hours straight without stopping. And it's, uh, you get your second wind and your third wind. in a bucket? Uh-huh. What bait is that? Squid? Squid. It's the moves, you know. After you've done it long enough, you know how to make the moves count so it isn't what it appears to be for us. And there's no, you know, once you set the, once the, you set the gear out, why, there's no great mental strain to it. It's just a case of trying to you know, it's most, it's all physical work, mostly repetitious, uh, like most fishing. It's very repetitious, uh, kind of monotonous work, <laughs> really. There's nothing, uh, you, have your, you have your thrills when you, at times, you know, something happens, you start to sink or something like that, but for the most part, it's really boring, monotonous work. How many you got left? Oh, about half of them. I get just two bundles. We'll make Set. No, this is the third bundle. Oh, all right, okay. Long line, and then we jig a little bit, you know, with the hand line. You saw that. Mm -hmm. We caught some nice fish there. Yeah. You know? The reason you could do that is because those bigger fish go to structures, you know, and they'll hang around structures like a wreck or, or, or you know, a real hard edge of bottom. Because we're in constant. The problem we're having is with the gill netters, we're in constant conflict with them because. I mean, it's no secret now with Laurent Sea where, where the best fishing places are. I mean, in a square mile, you've got one or two places that are really good, and, and they go there and put their nets on them, and, and they keep hanging up the nets on the structure, and they lose their nets and leave them there, and the bottom becomes sour, and the fish move away from it, and it's a constant battle. We're all after the same thing. We're all trying to make a living, and the draggers are having a hard time. You saw all the draggers around that day. There's, everybody's having a hard time. <laughs> We're all fishing on the same product, and it's less and less all the time. Ted! Hold it! Ted! What do you want to do with it? Maybe we can get it out. How bad is it? It would have been bad. It took the anchor. If everybody fished the way we fish, well, the resources would, would be fine. If you're going to have conservation, you can't have gillnet. You just can't. Put the window weight on. Window weight. Yeah. The machine's behind you. You can't see it. A lot of that bait is probably pollock and then beat up off the bottom, you know? Yeah. And the draggers, the draggers ruin the bottom. They level off the places where the, the fish would ordinarily be able to hide and things of this sort. And uh, they, to they level the bottom off. And another thing is, uh, they pick up fish, maybe four or five thousand pounds of small fish. Well, it's nice to see that first one. Yeah, down the other. They have to measure every one, you know, like just legal size or illegal size. In a half an hour, all those fish are dead. It doesn't make any difference whether they're legal or illegal. They just don't have the time to handle them. I mean, I, I, Keep them alive. I think it's terrible. Uh, discount. Yeah, it's a, it's so, I'm sure it's a terrible waste where we have a little fish come up and we trip him off and, and chances are he's going to make it fine. Hook and line is by far the purest form. And you get the best product. That's the thing. Chatham fish always had a very high quality standard fish. Chatham stakers were renowned everywhere for, you know, for, for the quality. Well, now the gillnet is a They've taken over and, and bring in a, they bring in a large percentage of state cod. Most of their fish are state cod, and uh, or they were, and uh, the quality. I mean, it's just you don't even want to talk about how bad it is. Either. You know, some of those things on a two-day soak, they can't even bring them in, and they'll discard. Some days they'll sit there and on a two or three-day soak, and they couldn't get out to get their gear after an easterly. They'll throw away more fish, more adult fish away in a day because they, they're so bad they can't bring them in because of the fleas or whatever, then we catch in a day. Well, that's not good conservation. That's not good for anyone. And they'll bring in marginal fish and the buyer <coughs> says, well, 
you know, I'm working on a per pound basis, I'll ship them for you. I'm going to get my 15, 20 cents a pound no matter what. That's the way it's been going downhill ever since. We well, both we both done gill netting. I've done it on my boat, and he did well, he did it on his when he had it. So we were, we're very familiar with that. I, I we didn't run the operation that way though. We didn't take the nets out and leave them out there. Stay with the net. Stay with the net. Bring them home. That was so you knew you, we had as good a product as you could get with a gill net. But still, there's something about a uh, fish that's caught by the gills. This whole he struggles in such a way that you could take a fish alive out of the net and cut it. And the flay will separate, kind of, right in the thickest part, where you wouldn't get that with a hook, a hook caught fish. Hook no, caught fish is firm, the whole flay. Uh, 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 there is, uh, not my comparison. We used to haul twice at night and, and stay with the gear. These guys leave it at least, a lot of them leave it two days. It's the people, the individuals, so. The, the fishery, a lot of it is the poor, the guys that take care of the gear and, and are there every day. At the, a lot different than the people that don't tend to gear up at all. They, they sloppy at it and they lose nets and the nets are all over the ocean laying around them. Plenty of them laying on the bottom. We picked up a piece of gill net. Uh, oh, this was about a month ago. And in it was a lobster. It was about a two and a half pound lobster. And boy, I, you know, we grabbed it. Boy, a nice hard shell lobster. And I said, well, I'll enjoy that. And I had no idea how long it had been in there. But I brought it home and I, I steamed the lobster and that whole two and a half pound lobster, there was there was about a half a cup of meat in the whole thing. All the inside, you know, was solely dying. But uh, this was a piece of net that, it, you know, it, they can't help it. Any fisherman, whoever, they're losing gear and, and uh, the nets, they lose them. Yeah, I heard a horror story the other day. A guy, a, a dragger, dragged up the equivalent of two and a half trailer truck loads of balled up gill nets. It took him two and a half hours to clear it. And he just throws it over the side again. What's he going to do with it? Bring it home? You know, where, you know, where are you going to put that stuff? There are no laws by which the gillnetters have to conform. They can set any amount of gear. They can set it anywhere they want to. They can make it from the bottom of the ocean, to the top of the ocean, from here to Europe and back, and they don't have to tend the gear ever. They don't impose any restrictions upon gillnetters at all. Nothing. They don't have to stay with the gear. They don't have to tend it. Couldn't bring home 10,000 pounds of fish and their gillnets, too. They couldn't physically do it. There are a few of them that could. A lot of them couldn't, and some of them, without any fish, couldn't get all the gill nets home, I'm sure. They, they, they don't know what's happening. They don't realize it. I mean, I know of last year two boats that each lost over 100 nets. When I say lost, either they got tore up or they had, but they replaced the gear bills were 100 to 125 nets. That's miles and miles and miles of nets we're talking about. The federal government doesn't want you to throw a six-pack container over because it might catch a fish or a strangle a bird. What about all this stuff? You know, that's laid over. We go on and on for hours about gill nets. Yeah, yeah. You know, gill nets and conservation don't go together. So it's, it's a nice, lazy way to go fishing. We have our game, fish and game management people, and the wildlife, uh, the uh, fisheries, everything. Um, they have to be very careful about what they say or do, or to try and change any rules or regulations, because if they come against these, up against these big organizations with their lawyers and everything, they, they crush it. If they say, you know, it's like deer hunting, well, we all know what happens when those deer are allowed to uh, just multiply. Then they die of starvation and things of this sort. And, you know, that's a minor thing. But as far as uh, seals, the seals are killing the flounder. Our fishing and our livelihood is so involved with politics. I mean, there are people in the government, especially now, and they've got the Marine Mammal Act. They're supposed to protect the whales, the right whales in particular, in this area, which is their breeding grounds, the Great South Channel, which is where the gill nets are by the miles. And they have all these laws that no one can enforce, but it'll have to take care of itself because the people that are making the decisions don't know what's going on. If you're running a boat, you can make it appear, you know, if I've got 10 sets of gill nets, I'm not looking to let you come on my boat and see what happens because I know I'm going to end up throwing away half of those fish as this guy because they're all eaten up by the sand fleas. They're not any good anymore. No one can use them. I won't even bring them in. So it's all that wasted. So you only see what I want you to see. I know fellows who fished off of Chatham that 
have, have one guy, and one guy in particular, has caught at least three whales in his nets in one season. And another fellow caught in one week in September, he was caught uh, a multitude of porpoises in his net. I mean, they're not going to admit to it. No one's going to admit to it. And, and I mean, you don't really physically gill that one unless it gets wrapped up, a tail wrap. You know, so they're being caught by it, and they're 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 not doing anything about it. I spent a hundred dollars last June calling Boston and Woods Hole and the Boston Globe, and I got absolutely no action at all from them. I mean, I told them what was going on. People that should know the Northeast Fisheries Council, whatever it is, Phil Coates. I I spent I don't know how many times I trying to get hold. Finally got hold of them. I explained. I just I was grind an axe. I just want to let them know what's happening. They had no idea how many how many gill nets physically were being set in this area down. And they it just grows it's like it's like they have the I think the gill nets must have the biggest lobby in the world. It's, it's, it's gonna to have to take care of itself. I mean these fish that we catch here, they don't come from Iceland or Europe. This is the same body of fish. They're just like salmon or herring uh, swallows, they return to this area, they go and they spawn, they come back. And there was a school of fish at Nosset for years. And the gillnets got up there, and they had four or five years on them, and they, they annihilated those, those big spawn fish. The fish came right to Nosset and they spawned right there. They had to have that temperature within a degree and a half. And, and, they, and those, they'd find them, and they'd just put their nets in the air, and that was the end of it. The fish were all involved in, in spawning, and, and and they have to be there. They couldn't leave there because that's where the water temperature was proper for them to spawn. You can't catch enough fish up there now, and neither can the gillnetters to make a day's pay even. I mean, uh, the gillnetters are very efficient. I know, I used them. And we catch so many fish you couldn't even lug them. have to give them to somebody else so many times. I mean, they're, they're deadly. And when they catch less fish, they end up putting more nets on. Now they're, they're using, we used to go with 30 nets. These guys are fishing 100 nets, one boat, 100 nets. So Ted, how many pounds? Fifteen hundred. Great. Yeah. I, I told him. I told Diane Paul we'd have fifteen hundred. We'll do it before we let them off. Where do you sell them? Right at the harbor? Uh, the Thomas fish comes down from uh, up Cape. Comes down by comes down from the bigger of the dock. So will they meet you at the dock? Yeah. They'll be there. We call them on the radio. They'll be there when we get there. For a little while, try it for half an hour, then we'll go in. We sunk 150 miles offshore. That was in 1977. Seven, yeah. November. November 4th. Yeah. November 4th. It was in the evening, just just, just about. Just dark. You know, just dark, and it was calm. We were loading on lobster traps, and and uh, one of the guys says, Geez, I think the boat's looks like he's settling down pretty well. And looked and said, Yeah, geez. And we cut the trawl, and a couple of guys went up on the roof and got the life raft off and threw it in the water and, and uh, I put the boat in gear and when I did she just started to settle more so I, I threw it out again and then she went right down by the stern and we heard the bilge alarm go off and, and the engine kept running and then finally the engine quit and the boat sunk. I tried to give a May Day. The whole thing transition took 10 or 15 seconds maximum. I mean we all found ourselves in the water. The boat still was afloat by the stem and the lights were all on. That's amazing, really. All the lights stayed, stayed on. on for at least an hour. I don't know, but I think there was a void in the in the in the trunk down in the cuddy, where the air had become trapped because the boat didn't sink. In fact, we'll make a long story short. When we got picked up the next day by a by a liquid petroleum ship, they found the ship, the boat again, and the coast guard put a buoy on it. The thing was still afloat then. Yeah. Well, we were out on the edge of the Gulf Stream, so the water wasn't that. Yeah, we were on the awful shelf. Cold. Right where it drops off. We were actually physically in the water for I don't know how long. It's hard to judge, but because we had trouble hour. getting, we couldn't get the. We swam away. We were hanging on to orange balloons when we swam swam away from the vessel and uh, the, what was left of it. What was we swam because we were afraid it would take us down. I came down on the deck and gee, it happened so fast. The alarm went off and I looked and I and the the water come flying out of the exhaust and all, I was underwater about four or five feet and uh, looking up in the lights and. Because that, uh, I, I kind of went down with it, but I, uh, I didn't even have time to kick my boots off, and, and I came up to the top, and I had a piece of line around my leg that I'd been tying pots down with, and I had an awful time getting that off. And I, but I got it off. So I went up and tried to open the life raft up. We couldn't get the thing open. 
when, and uh, so we swam away because we were afraid it was going to sink and take us down with it. So Ted got a hold of the raft and ripped it out, and we got it, got the raft open and got into it. Yeah, we went underwater, put my feet against it, pull as hard as I could, and then all of a sudden it popped open. Boy, I tell you, that was like a breath of spring. Whew. The great that you go to get in, oh man, we're all in that raft. I mean, we were in a cube. Four of us, four of us we're in that there. little raft, a four-man raft. But we knees, to, knees up against the other guy's back, we're all in there. I said, let's just go north. And well, there was a shipping strike at the time. And we and there wasn't any boats. So fishing. we took turns. There was a little hole on one side, and they opened on the canopy the other side. So we'd take two guys with paddle for an hour, and then uh, two other guys with paddle for an hour. We'd just keep going to the north. There was four of us. And, and we tried shooting the flares. And that, I mean, you could see a big ship right over there, and you shoot the flares. They don't see that thing. I mean, jeez. Really. Was it cold? That bottom of that raft it had no insulation. I can remember sitting on my hand trying to get the it sucked the heat warmth right out of you, you know, your body was kind of so sitting in that raft. In the morning, we could feel the reverberation from the propeller way before we saw anything, because it was still morning twilight. You could feel that reverberation, boom, boom, you know. And we didn't see it, we were looking around, couldn't see it. All of a sudden, we saw the ship, and it was coming for us. And they got up near us, and we shot the flare. And uh, the guy said on the bridge, it looked like a little streak of orange paint in the water that's off on the bridge, and that's all it looked like. That vessel came up just like we had a string on it. It just came right up to us. Yep. Yeah, amazing, right amazing, just amazing. He gave three blasts on the horn, which meant he's backing down, and uh, boy, we were like, <laughs> you know. So they turned around, came back, and they put a ladder down, and uh, they picked us up, and we got some dry clothes and uh, a little bourbon and <laughs> whatever else. I had a big breakfast, and I called the Coast Guard, and they came out with a 50 knot hydrofoil there. And well, yeah, by 10 o'clock in the morning, that morning, it was blowing 45 mile an hour northeast. I mean, it was a gale. Guys down here got caught in it, and they didn't. It took the windows out of their boats, and it was a really messy day. We were very, very fortunate. Yeah, I mean, one more hour they would never find. Well, when when yeah. we came in, we, they took us right into the showers and put it, put it give us so we could take us, you know, get warmed up a little bit. And and I remember coming out of the shower and looking out the the port there, and uh, and it was black fog. You couldn't see anything. No. Thick fog. And then we sat down to white linen. And Silver and <laughs> <laughs> so we're lucky to be here. No question about that. We still don't know what caused that sinking. I think I, I suspect that we had big lobster tanks on the boat, and one of the hoses let go, and and it was a wooden vessel, and the water went up underneath the sheet, and it went down inside and filled her up inside. It's the only way it could have happened because she was she was a good was solid back. boat. Something let go inside. Nice boat. May fifth. May fifth. May fifth. We started. Late the dollar shot, the guy's fishing. So it'll be cockfish really all season long until you stop fishing for the winter? Oh yeah. You don't change species oh. really. But like in September we might fish for haddock. Along along with the cockfish, you know, you kind of target the haddock too. Two years ago we were getting like six, seven, eight hundred pounds of haddock along with the cockfish. future doesn't look too good because of the, the numbers of fish. There's just so many, too much competition, too many people going for them. We'll see what happens. The tuna fishing right now is what makes it uh, a little easier because it takes a little pressure off the of cod fishing. A lot of people just, I mean, a lot of full time cod fishermen have given it up just to go tuna fishing, you know. And yeah, we go part time. We go tuna fishing when yeah, we yeah, can. What are you buying today? Just uh, mostly codfish? I think that's what he's got, pretty much whatever he's got. Yeah.